Dogs of Warcry is a new podcast from the Mortal Realms focusing on Warcry, a fast-paced cinematic skirmish game by Games Workshop. Join us for discussions on gameplay, rules, lore, painting, terrain building, campaigns, and events. In episode two of the second season, we're reviewing the Cypher Lords and the Untamed Beasts. Welcome to the Warband. My name is Eric, and answering the call with me this week is Josh. How you doing, man? Excellent, thank you. And Paven, how are you? I'm doing great. We are um, excited to be here. This is season two. I feel like a little confession. I feel like uh, first last episode, I wasn't quite ready for the new year. I wasn't quite in 2020 yet. I was still maybe left behind uh, some of my brain, but now I'm fully in 2020. We're in episode 0202, um, and it feels appropriate to to, to feel alive right now. It does. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. We're going to kick off uh, with the you know what we love to to do and what we've done over the last uh, couple weeks since we last recorded with the Forge of Mithraxis, the Forge of the Iron Golems. So, what have you guys been working on, building, painting, uh, playing on, or whatever uh, the last uh, couple of weeks? Josh, what have you been up to? Uh, been up to quite a bit, actually. So with the new uh, Cahadron Overlords Battle Tome dropping and everything else, I did get a gun hauler together. Been uh, checking out, uh, did some practice games with my KO, because that was my, my AOS army. Been having a lot of fun with that. I've also been working on my custom Warcry board, and, um, and also 3D printing a bunch of uh, Star Wars terrain for a friend of ours, because in exchange, she's going to give me the Warcry starter box terrain, which I'm going to combine with the Azerite Shattered Plaza to get some multi-dimensional terrain so we can use some of those and some unique board setups. Really looking forward to that. Very cool. Very cool. That keeps you pretty busy. Uh, Peyton, yeah. what have you been working on? Um, so I mentioned the Palooza last episode, and I've made incremental progress on that group. I um, decided to do all their skin and robes kind of in batch because I got kind of a good formula for it. And so I did that. Uh, I got those all done. And now I'm shifting towards kind of painting each one like a character model, like picking out all the doodads and spending time on them because they're such great sculpts and I really like them. So I'm, I'm getting pretty close to done with the brew get. Um, but then I was completely derailed when I picked up uh, Ripper's Snarl Fangs, the Underworld's Warband, um, for an event that our sister network, the What the Hex uh, folks are putting on, um, and they actually put on last Saturday. And um, so I switched gears and just painted, finished those guys and painted them up real quick. But now those are done. I'm ready to switch back to the Palooza. Um, nice. Yeah, the, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, I guess, I don't know, just my thought on like painting up something different like that is... Uh, I tried to fit them in with my normal destruction scheme um, that like my iron draws and my gloom spider are all uh, kind of the same kind of green with gray skin and all and all that uh, kind of standard. And it didn't really translate that well to Ripa's. Um, I think it was interesting because they have so much like kind of fur and um, kind of like leathers and then things that like uh, they kind of all blended into kind of one generic mush. And so I had to spend a lot of time like taking a lot of things up levels and changing the colors on things. And that was an interesting experience to try to like grow at. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I, sometimes you um, start a new army and you get a scheme together and you try it out on one unit and it works totally fine. And you, that unit's the base or you try it out on a hero and it, it doesn't always translate to every single unit in the army. And uh, I was almost there with my, my untamed beast. I painted my, my dog's gray or my um, rock tusk prowler's gray and that didn't feel right at first so i had to learn how to make gray work but no that's that's a cool challenge to be in um what have i been working on a lot of building stuff um uh coincidentally um i've been waiting for my uh the ironclad kit that i'm basing my my jukari drawn ironclad off of and I still haven't gotten it yet. And so in the meantime, I came up with an idea for a totally different ironclad uh, built out of the Sector Mechanicus terrain from 40K. Uh, and this is a, a Dwarden built and uh, Maneater Ogre uh, commanded vessel. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun building that, putting that, that together. 
Um, and I have been working some I, uh, with my MDF um, Shantytown build, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, which just means a lot of PVA glue in my fingers, which is just a different... <laughs> Like at the end of my hobby, usually maybe I've got a little super glue on my fingers here and there, but right, right. a whole handful, like a covered in PVA, seems is a little bit weirder. But yeah, um, uh, yeah. So been been working on a few of those things. Uh, not so I've been doing a lot. It's my hobby desk is a mess because I'm pulling together so many different terrain kits and trying to clip off bits and, and dry fit and this, that, and the other. And this and this terrain was not meant for what I'm doing it, so it doesn't all just do what I need it to. Um, but some of it works really well together. So, um, but yeah, so more Crider and Overlord stuff. So Josh, we do have to get that sky battle where we try and shoot each other down to the ground. Yes. Um, you know, uh, some races or some other really cool narrative things. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and the, uh, white dwarf sky battles rules. Yeah. I heard uh, about that. Yeah. I think there's some... We're going to start a spinoff podcast just based on Warhammer sky battles. <laughs> Oh, what was that uh, that 1990s um, Disney with the with the bears and like uh, the the airplane tailspin? Tailspin. That's what oh. the podcast to be called. <laughs> Ducktales. You could do something similar to that then, right? <laughs> uh, yep. So, um, all right. So uh, that's a lot of a lot of good progress in the forges. Um, now onto the path to glory. Um, the battles we've been been uh playing or fighting and i wanted to kick it off by introducing uh my new war band um i haven't i've talked about a little bit i've I've shared a couple of of stories about it and i've started a new stormcast war band for this uh season two of the podcast but also the new year with our uh second um uh, league season and that is the stormcast and uh, they're the bright flare and they are Seeking uh, one of the vaults that Sigmar uh, hid uh, with the Penumbral engines here in the in the eight points back before when it was the all points, and with the Necroquake that vault has the Penumbral engine has broken, um, and this uh, warband and many warbands have been sent uh, from the Stormcast uh, to go and recover this, and we want to be uh, the first ones there. Now um, we couldn't strike right near to the vault location because that would draw too much attention so we have to hoof it quite a bit uh this warband is led by a hunter prime her name is huckava bright flare and so she is kind of a new prime i guess this is kind of her first major quest she's done some other quests that have uh or fought some in in azir and, and been found worthy uh, but uh along with her then is a veteran uh, raptor um, uh, Farius wing strike who carries a long strike crossbow and he's kind of the eyes in the sky with his uh, uh, group of other wing and did you guys know that like a flock of hawks is called a kettle or like a large number is called a kettle I, did not. I didn't know that and it's interesting I was just looking up trying to figure out what is it called yeah. um, and so he's got a, he commands all the aether wing um, and you know eyes in the sky he Always tries to find good perches and and just kind of is a more of a battlefield um, commander, whereas Hecuba is a bit more of a frontline commander. For this quest, she is the the leader. Um, and then uh, joining them is a raptor uh, with a hurricane crossbow called his name is Railgun Starfall. Uh, and uh, Eric, I, ju- I just saw that in the notes, and I'm like, I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, it's it's spelled R A E L, a very fantasy version of Railgun. Uh, and then uh, he's he's kind of the a little bit of a firebrand. He's a little bit of you know uh, a little bit of a hothead, but uh, but he also kind of has to be in the fray. He doesn't get to just sit back like um, like Farius does, which is probably a point of contention between the two. Um, and then there's a number of I've got uh, was able to to pick up a couple other, you know, spend some glory on a couple others. I've got a couple, uh, another Raptor, Eldine, Shurbolt, and a Hunter, Taurus, Swift War. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of cool to have a, a little bit of a bench. And they have a, one Griffhound so far called Darboy. Um, <laughs> so uh, they're gathering supplies and clues on how to get there. So they don't have all the answers. They've managed to gather some supplies when they came across a pack of unmade. And so that was a really cool battle against um, Sean, 
mm-hmm. uh, from Chicago. And good news, Sean came up and joined us for some games, some of his first games, and now he's down in Chicago. He's got he had like four or five people joining him in his last, so he's his last night out. So hopefully he's got a, a group in the league starting up. Um, they had a particular hard time with uh with the Ideneth and a uh, railgun managed a gut wound, and so he's at uh, half health. So he's got only got ten. Uh, wounds, uh, which is pretty low for you know such an expensive uh, model on the roster. So I've swapped him out a couple of times with somebody else, but we're on the hunt for uh, is it the Life Stone uh, yep. artifact yep. to see if we can't get him healed up. So we were we were <laughs> in my last game for the artifact. I rolled a six and then I rolled a four, which was one off of uh, what I needed to to get that. Um, uh, so I was it was a and I and I have a catacomb, I believe, which lets me re-roll one of those dice. So I rolled it again to see if I could get that five, and I still got it. I didn't. I got. A, I think I got a three. Um, so I was almost there. They almost found a life stone. Um, let's see. We tried to eliminate a squig boss. You guys heard us talk. About, Paven and I talk about that, uh, but they failed to do that. However, uh, you know, they they did not leave uh, the squigs. The, the gloom spite without some emotional uh, <laughs> chaos <laughs> nice. by killing by killing that uh, that favorite squig boy. Oh. Um, and most recently, um, found an artifact that would aid them in finding the vault, but uh, or they located one that would help them. But uh, fought against a new player in our local league who found us through the the podcast, which is pretty cool. Um, and has been over the last two weeks playing us, and uh, so if playing his cypher lords so we located this object that would help them find the vault uh but the the cypher lords managed to slip away with it so not not our favorite thing so now we've got to find another another route so um, uh yeah (laughs) uh been really fun playing these guys and and i you know i started these guys hoping to kind of get a sense on how you know tough they are and there's certainly things that they excel at and there's certainly things that there can be like hard about them or when you play them for the first time uh, or play against them for the first time. Uh, but they've been re- really rewarding in terms of both, you know, front upfront combat and distance and movement and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they've got a lot of tools to play with. And so I've been really enjoying them. Um, we're not ready. I'm not ready to do a deep dive on them uh, yet. Um, as we're doing a deep dive on the the kind of the war bands we've been playing previous, but uh, hopefully down the road I'll have enough experience with them to to deep dive. So, um, so yeah, those are the bright flares. You'll be hearing more about Hekova and and her war band in the episodes to come. All right, I'm going to pass this over to Josh. Excellent. Yeah, no, we've had some fun games over the last several weeks. Uh, we've been since we're in between leagues, we've been trying some different types of games like the multiplayer games and uh challenge battles and and uh this particular last week we also tried the monstrous melee uh one thing we've noticed we've had a lot of fun but uh, the multiplayer battles can be a little tricky because in in the particular setups in the book most of the war bands have the you know one of the fa- the dagger hammer shield coming on round one round two or round three and then the game is done so some, for some war bands it's really hard to get involved and and participate in the victory objectives but this this last week it was a little better but there's there's definitely some things that we've started thinking about and how we can make this a little bit more interactive uh yeah. the monstrous melee was a blast uh you know we had a terror geist a zombie dragon a chimera and uh what was the other monster that aaron brought uh he or brought the... a cygor but it was a tree lord ancient that we played as a cygor right right and and we had a great time or Gorgon, of... i don't remember yeah, yeah, lots of smashing, and uh, uh, yeah, my stepson took the victory in that one. That was fun. Yeah, that yeah. one, that one's definitely. Um, I don't know. It's it's an interesting game, and it's fun to play. It's the it's kind of like advantageous to to sit back a little bit. Like yeah, being wait. the first into combat is maybe not the best, but yeah, but then it becomes kind of a boring game if you don't try and smash. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun to get monsters on the table and play. Definitely, yeah. No, it's fun to try out some of these unique missions and, and stuff before we yeah. go to the next league. 
And I think, yeah, I mean, the the multiplayer, we've definitely got to play some more and figure it out because uh, there's an aspect of getting in the game, like uh, with that many players on the board, any deployment that puts you in turn two or turn three, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of even more so can... Yep, and then uh, deployment. And I'm almost wondering if we should... So it starts, uh, the, the game's played with two boards, in size Mm -hmm. i I almost wonder if you couldn't um do deployment on a regular size board within that if that makes sense so you you have the 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 full two board field to play in but you deploy measuring from as if it were a single board inside of Mm -hmm. that so that you're closer together but you have room to move away that'd be interesting yeah so you start close, but you have you don't have the board the smaller board edge, I guess. Right, right. Uh, Get the option for more room if you need it. Yep, yep. So um, maybe it's something we can try out for the next one. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll get enough of those games in to to give some tips and feedback on that. Definitely. Paven, what have you been playing? How's your path to glory? Uh, going good. I haven't gotten a ton of games in. I, you know, our league ended, um, a few weeks ago. So we've been, you know, we haven't been playing too many, or I haven't been playing too many league games. I, I did participate in the four player kind of mash in the, uh, in the corners, uh, where my squig did bounce Josh's leader and then was quickly bounced out of there as well in turn. Yep, yep. <laughs> Other cool highlights from that game was my cave shaman was, uh, was being like kind of stalked by some sp- splintered fang on top of a building and he was able to uh like th- throw some sort of sorceress bolt uh and knock the uh the the offending i don't know what the the small ones are called like i don't know the, the uh, little bloods um like off the side of the building and that was a pretty fun uh <laughs> uh, uh i don't know a moment yeah uh, a, a cinematic moment um other than that uh, i did play in a warhammer underworlds tournament which is the wrong game but still uh Small footprint GW, so it's at least close. <laughs> and that was super fun. It's a super yeah. fun game. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, congratulations on uh, making a little bit further uh, through the Bloodwind spoils, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, we are entering the circle of pain. Ow. With a slight rewrite. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna call it the circle of paint. Um, so the paint is there, but it's it's about the hobby. So yeah. last season, the three of us each painted up a Varengard model, uh, and we posted it to the internet and had you all vote on the best one. And of course, congratulations again to Pavement for uh, that wonderful win. First, for our listeners, I want to uh, clarify that we didn't forget about the Varengard three-player, you know, the winner the winner of the last kind of uh, Circle of Paint competition. Uh, we're still going to do that. We just haven't scheduled about it. I guess I should say we did forget to do it, but we haven't forgotten forever. Uh, so that's still going to happen at some point, and we'll, we'll let you guys know how, on how it goes. This season, our challenge is going to be um, a little bit different. And we're, we're probably each season going to have a different challenge. And we invite you to join us in this challenge because these are things that we want to accomplish for ourselves. And so we assume, rightly or wrongly, that you may want to accomplish something like this as well. Um, so we're going to each be completing um, over the next, how many weeks is it? Do we say 16 weeks or 14 12, weeks now? Something left. All right. Yeah, there we go. Um, we're going to be each completing a full war cry board. Um, so, uh, and we're going to be taking a bunch of different approaches because we have different, each of us has different inf- inspiration, different needs, different things that we want to do. Um, and so you may have that as well. What are you looking to do? What is interesting to you? I'll make a, a shout out to, uh, um, one of our friends, uh, Jacob Berry. Um, and, uh, he built an entire vertical board. Um, like the Cliffs of Insanity, I believe he called it. Uh, yes. Which, from, which is, isn't that from our favorite uh, Princess Bride? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, it's a completely vertical board that you have to traverse up ladders and walkways, etc. cetera. Um, and they've had a blast making that. So shout out to him. We'll um, check our Twitter and, uh, you know, come over to our Discord and you can see pictures of it. Um, 
so we're gonna we're gonna be sharing that to put Paven on the spot. Why don't you kick us off with your ideas, your approach, um, and and or or whatever you, you're thinking if you've narrowed it down to anything yet. Um, go. Well, thanks, Eric. Where I'm thinking as far as my terrain project. Um, now, the most easily extendable one, or the one I want to kind of dive into, the, or would be easiest to dive into, is the um, kind of the uh, mushroom ruins of the Gloom Spike Gits. Um, so this is kind of expanding upon my Loon Shrine and various Azerite rune pieces I have, and fungling them up. Um, where I would really like the board to end up, in my imagination, is kind of a lot of like platforms and walkways and a lot of add some natural features so some kind of like i don't know blasted pillars of salt or kind of something along those lines to kind of make it seem a little cavernous and dark and um but still kind of have the like kind of desert badlands feel that feel that my like my the basing scheme for my destruction forces have but also kind of the the, the color plaid i'm using for that terrain um that's one idea i'm not hard committing to it because i kind of cycled off that a whole section of hobby for myself. Um, another thing I'm very excited about is the um, the new uh, Ravage Land set. They just announced today. Um, we're recording on Sunday. Um, they announced, oh boy, what is it called? The Soul Drain Forest, which has a yeah. bunch of new Sylvaneth Wildwoods in it and some Time Warm Ruins. And getting that box and using that to inspire me to create something... Um, I don't know, unique and earthy within the eight points or within the mortal realms. And so that is, you know, I'm not hard committing to anything right now, but that's kind of where my, my thoughts are at. I know, uh, Eric, you, Eric and Josh, you guys both have a, you know, more solid plans and I'd love to hear about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And that's cool. I mean, I like that we're starting the challenge now. I have a good solid idea. You don't, that gives me a better shot at beating you this time around. <laughs> Right. Um, so you know you you keep you keep pushing that down the road. I'm cool. I'm cool with that. <laughs> uh, I kid. I kid. All right. Uh, so my project uh, you've heard me talk about, and I feel a little bit bad that it's still a project on my board. But I'm hoping that you out there have had this feeling too, where you've got this project, you like this idea, but you get sidetracked, you get stalled, etc. So my challenge, the challenge that I'm uh, picking back up is my shanty town uh, board. Now, this came about, even started before Warcry even came out. I was thinking about Warcry. I was excited about Warcry. Um, I was excited about skirmish boards, and I had this idea, this drawing for um, kind of imagine the walls of Hammerhall or one of the other cities of Sigmar, like the outer castle wall uh, made of stone or whatever, and all of the people who couldn't make it into the city. Right? All the people kind of left outside, whatever that is, whatever reason, etc. But you know what? They're squatting. They're pulling boards. They're you know grabbing stuff, and they're building walls as close to the Stormcast as possible, as close to the defenses as possible, because the realms are a dangerous place. So, but this is also the riffraff. This is also the worst of the worst. These are, there's a reason why they probably didn't get left, didn't get let in. So, um, it's haphazard. It's um, not well made. It's not well architected. It's not planned, um, but it has uh, you know different needs. And so the it, this idea came out. Uh, I worked with a company called War Cradle Scenics, who does a r- lot of cool terrain for um, games like Wild West Exodus and, and Malifaux, and they're an MDF. So they kind of create these different themes and moods, and then hope that. The players of those games buy into that. And the, the theme that they created for Warcry and AOS is called Gloomsburg. And it's kind of a, um, a more, f- it's fantasy. It's got the the timber and stucco, um, you know, half timber type style buildings. Um, but they're a little more run down. They're a little more ruined. They're a little bit more uh, shoddy or whatever. And so that fits really well. And there's platforms. And one of them is this big windmill piece uh, that has, you know, four, uh, five, layers to it or levels to it and i'm incorporating that so that the top layer of that may be level six or seven um so the vision is uh this is also mdf which i i have worked with some but i'm not as familiar and it's it's not the tough part about it is it it, or the, the good thing about it is it does glue uh and it becomes really strong because that glue seeps into the wood and 
and uh, bonds really like really well, and it can hold a lot of weight once it is glued. But unlike the plastic glue, or um, and I, I could use some super glue, but I don't think it bonds as well, um, uh, and it's just not as quick. So when I make um, put something together and I glue it, I have to rubber band it and I have to let it dry. So it's a little bit more time consuming of a project in that regard. You're making pr- little bits of progress every night and let it and keep going. Um, but that's that's kind of the gist of it. Um, my some of the things that I want to include in this um, are a working, well maybe not a working, but some way of having an elevator. Um, so having a like a, a a wench that pulls up um, a platform so you could you know kind of ride up that. Um, I'd like a zip line, uh, whatever that means, or or you know kind of thinking about what kind of mechanics could go with that, um, and. I want it built up against a wall, so uh, it'll kind of set to one side of the board instead of directly into the middle um, to give the impression that there's more of it beyond what you see. So, yeah, so those are some of my themes. Um, I've got a lot of the pieces built, and I think I'm going to end up needing to use like the frames or the sprues that you punch out the pieces that build the houses and, and windmills. I might have to use those as additional support pieces or kind of to, to uh, fill it out, I guess it were. Uh, so that's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, it's nice to have that material. Yeah. But, but yeah, so I'm a little daunted by it. I'm building a lot of different pieces and hoping they all go together in some way. Uh, so in, in some regard, I'm building it like an uneducated architect <laughs> want to be uh, just trying to get into the walls. So. Yeah, that's what I got. That's what I got. Awesome. Um, Sounds great. Then Josh, we're gonna we're gonna let you go next, only because I think you've probably got the most strongest vision and you've got the most work done, and you're introducing some interesting new ideas into the concept of building Warcry boards. So why don't you introduce us to that? In our Discord channel, we have a wide variety of people who kind of chime in with projects and and their artwork and miniatures and modeling. And one of the concepts that had come up is, uh, you know, discussion on Warcry boards. And some people have created some very static diorama type Warcry boards, which look amazing, but you lose that modularity that you have with the current Warcry setup. And so as part of that discussion, we kind of came upon, well, maybe you could do a Warcry board that's got modular sections that you could create like more of a diorama. But if it's in like, say four sections of 11 by 15 inches, then you can rotate it and combine them. So you still have that modularity, even though each board section is, is a little bit more static. And, uh, that kind of generated some ideas in my head in terms of creating a unique Warcry board and testing out this concept of what does this four piece modularity work? And so I did some browsing and, and uh, a lot of research into, you know, kind of on Pinterest and other fantasy ruins and types of images and, and kind of compiled something together, which I think is going to work well. And so I'm starting with a uh, kind of a jungle type ruin. It's got five columns per board. And this particular section arrangement is going to be identical. All four sections will be the same. And the reason for that is I'm going to have each board with five columns. There'll be some water channels kind of going through each of them. To, so it can also act as a sewer system, potentially, with the idea that the columns would allow a second tier of playing, either with ruins or walkways or bridges. But also I could add a, a board on top of it and allow, a, you know, a, it's actually a two-tiered playing table. So you could play a multiplayer game instead of two boards side by side, they'd be on top of each other. And you would have maybe magical circles or elevators or ways that models could quickly move from one section to another so that you're not limited on actual movement distance. But then you would get multiple tiers of playing levels. And so I'm kind of looking forward to that and the ability to slide in other sections to change the layout of the board itself either to make the temple look like it's larger or to add a new types of environments. So I've got the, the four boards themselves made and uh, one set of five columns made. And I'm currently working on the other three, trying to uh, figure out some patterns I'd like for detailing the columns, but doing it carving into styrofoam by hand takes a long time. <laughs> so, yeah. so I've also been evaluating 
different ways I could add those patterns more quickly, either 3D printing patterns or using some sort of textured metal, uh, you know, punch outs or something else. So I still need to think about that and how best to do it. But uh, my, my combination of, you know, uh, insulation foam and, uh, and the foam between foam board, which I took the paper off and then use a, a, a green stuff world brick pattern roller to, to put some patterns on that to, to build the board upon. So that's all turned out well. But yeah, I've got to figure out the patterning and the columns and put those together so I can do some testing. But I think I think it's coming along well and I'm looking forward to getting it prepared so that we could try it out and see how well it works. Nice. I'm I really like what you said there about doing going to a, a two tiers for multiplayer games so that you have distance uh, but the potential to change that distance quickly through elevation shift or falling or jumping or whatever. Exactly. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and you're using a, a ton of wide uh, variety of, of materials and scratch building this and working off um, the you know this idea of quarters that you can change around and move around uh, depending on the game. Um, I'm working off of an MDF, just taking a kit and changing it a bit. Um, Paven, your some of the ideas you're thinking about is taking these ravaged land sets and altering them and improving them um, through very different approaches, um, and that's what I kind of like about this uh, challenge is that we get to kind of explore our own way in a in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that uh, you know those listening, all these options are available to them. They'll get to hear as we go where our roadblocks are, um, you know what works, what doesn't, etc. And excited for that. Um, I don't know if at, at this time I would say uh, what what just an idea of what the the winner takes all kind of uh, reward here. First of all, I mean I think we're all going to play on once they're all done. We're all going to play on all the boards at some point. Definitely. But Definitely. perhaps perhaps the we have a similar we play a game on the winning board. Um, painted miniatures and you know cool pictures and photos and all that kind of stuff. So we do a little bit more of a um, I don't know what, how what to say like a a really cool game uh, and mm-hmm. and and recording you know uh, through through photography or whatever yeah, um, of definitely. what's going on and how we play. So that could be kind of cool. Any other st- stakes that you guys would be interested in exploring for this one? Well, you could add the, you know, whoever wins, you know, and we play on their board, they could have a couple traps, perhaps, that they could have on the board that the other warbands have to navigate. Absolutely. Kind of that, that home territory kind of thing, or that they've, exactly. they've, they've squatted there for a while and you're coming into their space. Yep. Those are all cool ideas. Anything, any thoughts from you, Pravind? Uh, for winner um, of the, the, the circle of paint, um, yeah, I, it really depends on who wins because I think we should <laughs> lean in narrative. Yeah, if I win, lots of <laughs> lots of great benefits. If you guys win, so maybe some minor kind of one more destiny level. Yeah. Um, if I win, you buy me buffalo wins. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that that wasn't actually where I was where I was actually going. Um, it's because like the winning board. We, I I think we it it makes a lot of sense to play it on the winning board, play the game. But I want you know depending on what board wins, like it kind of changes the narrative sure. spot we yep. are literally playing on. And um, I would like to be kind of the advantage, whatever it to be, to be based on the kind of the board, and then then being able to tell a story of like why you know you have twice as many warband fighters or every hits a critical or, you know, whatever we come up with. Yeah. Um, cool. Very, very I like cool. that idea too. Yeah, those are cool. All right. Any more you guys want to share on, on this uh, circle of paint uh, before we move on? I just want to talk about like why maybe this is too philosophical for a uh, miniatures based podcast, but like why we changed the name. And for me, it was really big because like, it's supposed to, this is supposed to be like a fun thing we do that to like motivate and challenge each other. And it's not supposed to be torture <laughs> right. and calling it the circle of pain really struck the wrong tone, uh, after we are done recording. So I really, I'm really happy that we're in a much more kind of, uh, lighthearted place than we were on our initial attempt at rebranding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my feeling was it should be fun to do, but a painful to lose. 
uh, so the let the punishment fit the crime. Uh, but, nice. uh, anyway, okay, no, I, I, no, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, all right, all right. I think you're right. All right, let's move on to the visions of madness, and these are uh, the releases and news about Warcry um, that have come out uh, just um, this past. Uh, weekend, uh, we've gotten uh, kind of a, a reveal of orders for this week. So when this comes out, uh, orders are going to be coming up for the new Warcry stuff. Um, and then next week, January 24th, uh, we're going to have reveals. Uh, Games Workshop will have reveals at the uh, Las Vegas Open. Um, and there'll be more stuff for us to look forward to. Um, so why don't we talk about the pre-orders that are up this week? Some of these things are things we'd seen and we were uh, already know about, but we didn't know what we were going to get. Um, so Paven, uh, what's what's up for pre-order this week? Uh, we got a long list. I'll, I guess I'll just start getting into it. Um, first, the Orgroid Myrmidon um, is up for pre-order. That is a hero model, a mercenary model um, for Chaos Warbands. It's a big old uh minotaur looking beast uh very cool miniature the spire tyrants are up for pre-order um the seventh chaos warband that was that we've known about since the original core book launched um and we've seen the models for a while but we're, they're finally getting their own their own box so we can jump into those um we're also getting a number and this is not something we knew about or necessarily expected but a bunch of non-chaos box sets um, one for the Night Haunt, one for the Gloom Spike Gits, and one for the Stormcast um, Vanguard. Oh my, oh my gosh. I was so excited by these. I did not expect these in any way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and feel like it's a huge um, divergence from what Games Workshop has done for their uh, small box games or box games or these side games. And yes. I don't know. I, I feel like it. It means a lot for how well Warcry is doing and how well it's been received. I agree. Well, yeah, I like the game for sure. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it was definitely broke the pattern as far as their releases go, which is cool. Um, I am, uh, I'm a little nervous that about them releasing. Like, okay, so for the the Banshees and the Gloomspite Gets, they're both being. You get the car- the cards that have already been out, and you get a, a good collection of models. Um, both of those boxes are actually they're adding an additional fighter type to those established warbands, um, the the banshees and the sneaky snufflers um, from the night pot and the, into the gloom spike gets. Um, I don't know. Does that mean everybody has to buy those boxes, even if they have all the other cards for the one new card? I don't know. I don't know exactly. So that feels a little weird to me. Um, sure. Yeah. But sure. I'm, a, I'm guessing. Oh, but I'll take more products. I'll take more rules. I'm not gonna like you know lift a look at gift stores and them out. Um, uh, I, sus- I suspect they would probably reveal those cards like in the annual tome at the end of the year as well. It's, it's my suspicion. But yeah, I think in the immediate short term, you would probably have to buy those box sets to get those cards. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, you can drill into that one, especially the Gloom Spite. Say, hey, they already had. I mean, there's a there's a wealth wealth of choices already, yeah. um, and so adding another couple of options is interesting. The thing I would never have see, expected is it. It feels like so we do get these like big. Two army boxes is like introduction boxes. So most recently, Ether War had um, a Caradron Overlord army with a new hero and a Disciples of Zinch army with a new hero. And those obviously contain sprues that have already come out separately, like in their own boxes. And so they come in and they're at some, you know, uh, deal, right? The, 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 you're not playing full price for each of those kits. And so we definitely have had that before, but to have a new like box that I'm assuming is just going to be available um ongoing for Warcry that is a repackaging of old of other sprues that have been out before. Mm-hmm. Um you know that they've I mean in my head I'm thinking you know they're printing new boxes for sprues that you could get before, right? They're, you know, their sorting and, and packaging is changed in order to put stuff out for this. Um, I don't know if that goes back into their like production of, Hey, we only need, we need this many of this sprue and this many of this sprue and they're going into here. Um, so all of that just feels like it's 
a really important thing for them to create a new combo product or a new packaging of a product specifically for this game. And and we you know we did our episode in season one of mustering uh, your warband okay. and how you get these things, and it, it just feels like it's making. I think we knew that the chaos stuff was going to stay and be easy to get, but mm-hmm. there and that the the non chaos stuff was just kind of like, eh, it's just we had to do this, you know, or we we want to, you know, it's an afterthought. But this feels like they're really into making all of the warbands a part of this game, and that's yeah. I like I like that a lot. Yeah, and I think it reduces the the cost, the barrier to entry for those people who may not have those models already, which is really nice because yeah. you don't need multiple box sets anymore. Which would be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and yeah, Josh, I think that's the that was a great point. And I don't want to complain about a product that isn't been released yet. Like I don't, I, you know, even though I guess I guess I already did, but I want to kind of take it back a little bit because I want to you know, <laughs> just like tease it. And yeah, I think the most important part is like how do you ease the entry of people into Warcry? Because I don't think it it sits in a really great place for folks that just that you know want to get into Games Workshop miniatures and miniature games, and but you know a full 40k army would be too intimidating. And I think this lowers the barrier, especially the mental barrier of like, what do I need to buy? Yeah. And just having a box with everything you need in it um, is great. And I think there's a lot of interest in the non-chaos warbands. And this gives you one of each from each of the major factions to to jump into. So I think that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, what else did we get? Uh, or what else was revealed for, for pre-order this weekend? Uh, card packs for nine new war bands. Um, so it seems like we're doing this in waves. We knew about the 15 new factions from the Tome of Champions. Um, but so the first nine are, are, are coming in a couple weeks. And those include Beasts of Chaos, Zinch Demons, Zinch Arcanites, Caradron Overlords, Skaven, Ogre Maw Tribes, Osiar Bone Reapers, Slaves to Darkness, and Stormcast Warrior Chamber. Um, Which one are you guys most excited about? K.O. Yeah. The Hotter and Overlords. Yep. yep. Definitely that one. Out of, oh. out of this group, um, I'm excited for Slaves to Darkness for myself and mm-hmm. Skaven uh, to drag my buddy into the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. So Slaves to Darkness, when we got the Monsters and Mercenary book, had a Slaves to Darkness War Bandit with a, a Varengard model. What do you think? Do you think Varengard model is going to be in this uh, version of the army? Well, no, well that was that be. was Hand of the Ever Chosen. So that was a little ah, different. I gotcha. Yeah. So, no, yeah. I think Varengard are of a power level that, <laughs> that <laughs> should not. I mean, they should be like a big bad in the game of Warcry. Like, I really uh-huh. want to keep a, a lid on like the kind of the powerful characters that show up in the game. Um, just so, I guess Gotrek is in here, so never mind. Like, he's well, that's, a, that's a unique he, challenge battle, though. Yeah, that's but he, yeah, I guess he does. He the, the game is, can you survive for, or how long can you survive? So, yeah. I guess. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't think Berengard have their place in a in a war band proper. Yeah. Uh, but I really like them in that in that challenge battle. Yeah, no, I think it'll be like you know the Marauders, maybe Chaos Warriors, maybe we'll get a, a sorcerer or not. You know. Yeah. No, I. Uh, for me, it's ogres. Um, I definitely, I mean, I've been working on the KO, one of my favorite armies that I, that that I've been building, and I can't wait to put them on the table either. But to have ogres, um, the Maw Tribe, out on the table is gonna be really cool, and see those guys. Uh, I mean, they're huge. Um, yeah, definitely. And so putting them on the on the table and see them bashing things, uh, and they're fast. I think. <laughs> so, uh, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, so. I am. I have I've been interested in Zinch Arcanites. I got the Silver Tower box set for uh, you know the Warhammer role not role playing I'm sorry but the Warhammer Quest. So yeah. I have some models I could use for that. Beasts of Chaos also sound really cool. Nothing I really wanted a whole army of, but I think this is going to be a great entry point for building a unique little warband to play with, which would be awesome. Yeah. Yep. All right. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to get into our victory condition. A deep dive into the Cypher Lords and the Untamed Beasts. We'll be right back. Hey, what are you doing this far out, alone, in the Bloodwind Spoils? Well, I'm out here tracking a new hatching of Raptorix. A bit meaner when they're chicks, but dang if they ain't the tastiest thing this side of Karngrad. No, I don't get out this way often. 
Well, yeah, we move around a lot, but we always make our way back to the Mortal Realms Discord channel. We share our tips and tricks for staying alive in the Bloodwind spoils, and we share whip picks as we're fashioning new instruments of death and mayhem. Hey, you should come by and check out camp. I swear, no one will eat you the first day. Whoa, I think I hear those Raptrix chicks. I'd share the find, but I think I've already done you one solid for today. May Archeon notice ya, if he doesn't see me first. <laughs> Welcome back. Our victory condition this episode is to bring focus to two of the war bands uh, that we've been playing and enjoying. Mine, Eric, uh, the Untamed Beasts, and Josh's uh, favorite, the Cypher Lords. We're going to focus a lot on the aspects of these war bands, uh, from the feelings about the narrative and the aesthetic, how the fighters, um, the various fighters that are available to choose from, how they play on the battlefield. Now, we are not... Uh, experts on all of these things and you know like you out there you've played some of these for a period of time um, but maybe you've played them differently maybe you've uh, leaned on a different part of the warband than we have so we're going to bring it from our perspective and our hope uh, is that you see why we love these warbands and maybe you would consider giving them a try uh, playing them uh, you know with some of the, the thoughts and experiences that we've had first up the cypher lords Josh, why don't you lead us to talking about these guys? I'd be happy to. So I think that the best way to introduce the you know the Cipher Lords in general is I'm going to read the short description that's in the starter book, just because I think it encapsulates a lot of information about them and their motives, which will kind of go into some further detail about what we like about them and how we use them, et cetera. Or else. So starting with this, from the outside, the Ziggurat city of Naxid appears a place of culture and reason, as enlightened as any other great stronghold of Hish. In fact, this facade of civility hides a terrible truth. The mass cipher lords of Naxid have sworn their souls to chaos, worshipping it as a formless entity of infinite aspects of pure, protean, essence of trickery and madness. The cipher lords seek not simply to defeat their foes, but to drive them to insanity with sorcerous illusions and alchemical bombs that spew hallucinatory poisons. The ultimate goal of these mysterious cultists is to earn a place at Archeon's spy masters and assassins, the better to spread the insanity of chaos across the realms. Eyes wrought with silver and gold can be found across the Varen Spire, seeing all and relaying their secrets back to the cipher lords. And uh, one of the the things that captured me the most about the Cypher Lords when I first saw them revealed was a huge fan of, of monks in the role-playing sense. I played monks in D&D and having these be warrior monks and with, with a theme of madness, because I'm also a large Lovecraft fan, it just captured me there. So you know, even before I knew what kind of play style or anything else, those two themes really kind of captured my interest and intrigue. And obviously we saw the models. I think they're extremely dynamic. You know, the way the the hair flows, the way their body movement is, is, is really dynamic. I was a little put off by the, the helmets a little bit because it seems large. And you're like, well, you know, it's got to be heavy, right? Pulls on the models a little bit. How does that work? But over time, as, as some of you, the listeners might know, um, I... I started to like them more, and I even decided to model some ears on them to make them more fitting to my theme in terms of the house of Kitsune, the house of the fox. And, and in that way, I kind of encapsulated that, although I know other people did some conversions or not. But overall, I thought the models were really interesting, had a lot of movement and, and uh, dynamic activity, and, um, and had that kind of uh, faceless uh, chaos you know, so you never know what's behind the mask, what's going on behind the mask, which I thought was really cool. And the Thrallmaster, of course, is a really characterful model with the alchemical potions. And those are my initial impressions. So I'm going to see what Eric and Paven, uh, what did you guys think? So my first impression, um, I'm, maybe, I, I'm gonna maybe going to tell a little bit of a long story, but I remember when each warband was being revealed slowly in the lead up to War Cry, and we were we noticed quickly that the pattern was like one war band from each of the realms. And we were counting up the war bands and like, okay, we got death. We got shadow. We got, um, we got beasts. We got iron. And then it was, it was down and we had five of the six. And of, of the, of the ones we had left, one was, uh, Azir. And we were pretty sure we weren't going to get that one because chaos has supposedly been purged out of there. 
Um, and then there was fire and um, hish, the realm of light. And we're like, and I, I remember like the, the, how I felt and it seems like the community kind of was similar because we have, we've spent so much time in the, the realm of fire in, uh, in Akshi. And it was like, my, my gut is they're going to give us an Akshi ore band, you know? And it's because we've, we've spent so much time there. It's such a flushed out place, like camp, multiple campaigns. Um, and we just don't know that much about Hish. And so like, it's my heart, my heart was wanting Hish and my, but my mind was telling me, Actually, um, and then when these guys dropped, it was like, "Oh my God, they did it! Those madmen!" Um, <laughs> it was a hit war band, because it was like one of the first time we had seen actual miniatures come out of that realm. Um, yeah, and that was very cool. They have a really great aesthetic. Um, it was like they're it, a new kind of flavor. We maybe don't see too much in GW miniatures, or although we're seeing more and more of like kind of a more Eastern aesthetic and more, a lot more Kung Fu poses and um, kind of, it was, it was very interesting. It was like a new theme and a new cultural element within the mobile realms. And so I thought that was all very cool and I was very excited. Yeah. Great yeah. points. Yeah. I was, I was right there with you with that, you know, uh, bringing them from Hish and, and being super excited about that. And the headbands are uh, the, the headdresses, as you were saying, Josh, um, Though, you know, when you think about a lot of other cultures um, around the world, like tall headgear is not uncommon. Now, yep. you don't typically see that on a more acrobatic um, uh, kind of warband. But um, this was actually the first models that I was able to get my hands on and build. And for the proportions and for how they, they were, uh, you know, on the table – those those headdresses actually become pretty defining in terms of balance uh, of the model themselves, you know, aesthetically on the table, um, and from a from an opponent, uh, critical in, in figuring out who's who, <laughs> uh, who do I need to be worried about, um, and so uh, you know the that's been interesting to not only have them defined that way aesthetically, and I'm sure if if, if you know we'll talk about conversions etc. But to be able to have that be a distinguishing where the, the taller headdresses are the mirror blades and the wider headdresses are the uh, mind bound, um, et cetera, you know, so things like that. Um, but yeah, the masked faces and, and a lot of cloth, a lot of body movement, a lot of bare skin in musculature. And it's, it was a really cool army uh, to come out. Yeah. Well, they definitely look like warrior monks, which is, is it's just a nice, you know, they, they went with a good theme and I think it works well for this particular war band. So in terms of the, you know, what are their overall ideals? You know, I think their theme statement is let madness reign. And, uh, you know, so kind of going back to the origin, you know, they're they're trying to spread madness to the realms. And they're, this particular, the Cypher Lord Warband is, is trying to capture Archeon's attention so that it can help him do that or find a better means to do that. And uh, I think it, one of the interesting lore aspects that we really don't get insight to is... It talks about the Cypher Lords in Noxseed. It talks a little bit about Noxseed, but we really don't know, is the entire city devoted to chaos? Or is it really the Cypher Lord factions within Noxseed are devoted to chaos? And that's that's an interesting aspect that'll be interesting to find out later uh, at some point in time. But I think um, one of the unique aspects is that they talk about, um, well, at least in, in one of the stories in the Warcry anthology called The Method of Madness, focuses on the Cypher Lords. And they do talk about the Thrallmaster as a noble. And so it gives us an indication that in this particular city that there is probably some sort of king or queen or ruling body because there are nobles present. And in this particular case, it happens to be a Thrallmaster. And again, draws the question, are all Thrallmasters of noble lineage or, lineage or not? Or, you know, so uh, there's a lot of information we don't know about all the warbands, but we pick up a little bit here and there by this one from this one, which is which is interesting, I think. So, Absolutely. Um, I think uh, you know my personal take is I like the idea of them spreading madness. And again, if if nobody's read the Method of Madness from the Warcry anthology, uh, you really should. It kind of mirrors the Spy in the House of Talons quest from the main rulebook, and it has a really unique spin at the end that fits right into this Warband's theme. So you definitely got to love it. Yeah. Uh, it any other thoughts you guys have on, you know, their particular lore or backgrounds or what you thought? I, 
I thought it was interesting in that initial paragraph that you read and in some of the lore that um, how much they know they're devoted to chaos. Um, like that, and I don't, again, I don't know if, you know, the chaos, big C chaos or little C chaos, um, you know, not sure, you know, a lot of the, the shtick of the, these war bands is that they're worshiping something, but it's not our, you know, main four chaos gods, Korn, mm-hmm. uh, Nurgle, Zinch, Slamesh, that it's some either demigod or, um, their version of one of those gods, you know, it's kind of like, the backwater, um, you know, um, interpretation of some natural phenomenon kind of, uh, religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but for these guys, I know, you know, it, it seems like they're, they feel aware. more aware of what they're doing than other war bands. Yeah. So I, some of the other things that we'll touch on now is kind of, uh, you know, obviously all the war bands have their unique abilities, and um, we're just going to touch on how the abilities of the Cypher Lords kind of uh, portray how they play, as well as their kind of background. As, as you might imagine, uh, as warrior monks, a lot of their abilities portray into some acrobatic type moves. You know, So their double is throwing chakrams or throwing stars, which the, a lot of the models have, or you can add to them, which kind of goes back to that Asian, Middle Eastern uh, kind of feel. Uh, another double they have is acrobatic leap, where essentially they get to do move act and action, but they count as flying, so which is really cool. Uh, and, and another double is with the with the glaive weapons, you could potentially hit multiple models at once. Although I haven't typically used that very much at all. The two triples um, are highly defining for this particular warband, and um, both the luminate and the uh, thrallmaster uh, can use the shadowy recall ability which can summon a minion, which is uh, any of the mirror blades or the mind bounds from within 12 inches and put them a distance away from them within the, the dice number. So really helps their mobility, really shows some of that magical alchemical element uh, trickery where, the, yeah, this model is over there, uh, now it's over here, and it's highly useful for certain missions. The other triple ability, the Shattered Gloom Globe, um, is, is used by the Thrallmaster, and essentially he's throwing down a Shadow Bomb, and all the fighters within a six-inch radius lose one of their attacks because they don't know what's going on. Again, going back to that alchemical trickery, madness sort of theme. And and the quad itself is very similar to the, the generic quad where they get an extra move and attack. But it goes back to their acrobatic abilities, where it's called the spinning somersault strike. And they count as flying up to three inches during this entire move action. So the abilities really tie into the character of the army, and I think really uh, highlight some of the elements. And we'll, we'll kind of touch on those in a little bit. But it's just before we do that, is that, you guys had any thoughts on the abilities? Any other input? Uh, yeah, uh, the one where you teleport is very good. Uh, yeah. I've been using that one to, for great effect against me. It really increases the threat range of um, of all your fighters. And something you got to keep in mind is like, what is a double move from a leader or your uh, lieutenant, uh, and then the distance of that of whatever that that teleport is. Like, right. what, that's the true threat range, and that's a double attack on top of that. Right. Uh, and if you marry that with a cro- quad, you can kind of you can get a bunch of attacks on anybody from across the board. Um, or I guess that's seven dice though. But you know, if if in that case, um, and so like any kind of move where you can reposition or free movement abilities are always very good. Um, so that one I, I especially kind of think about as like a a, a thematic and strong game wise uh, ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, the. I don't. I don't know that there's not been a game playing against Cipher Lords where I'm not thinking, how do I stop the teleport? <laughs> right. Uh, just to to take that off the table because that that mobility, you know, that's a switch. It's you know, it, it ends up dropping like thirty percent of the mobility of the army by move, removing that. You know, that definitely makes um, the Thrallmaster and the Luminate high priority targets in this yeah. army. Yeah, I agree. All right, so then we'll kind of go on. You know, we'll talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of the particular warband because 
every war band's got strengths and weaknesses and it's you know just like any army or any game you play knowing your opponent as well as you know your own forces helps you mitigate some of those strengths and weaknesses so for the cypher lords uh my personal take is that their strengths are definitely mobility uh the other benefit they have going for them you know they have a high movement rate of five and then of course they have the ability several of their abilities give them the the uh, a fly keyword you can use during the, con- the the movement round, but they also have a high number of attacks and generally they have high crit damage. You know, I think the warband has got a nice mix of two range weapons and, and one inch range weapons, and um, but the drawbacks are you know they're most of the models are toughness three. Um, the, just the the thrallmaster and the luminate have toughness four and strength four. The uh, Mirror Blades, which are the more elite fighters, um, have Strength 4, which helps. And um, But yeah, the number of attacks, you're essentially fishing for critical hits to do a lot of damage. And it can be quite effective. But they're Toughness 3, 10 wounds for most of the models. And they tend to be more expensive than some of the other Warbands, where your, your cheapest guy is 75 points. And then the next the step up is 80. And then it's 115 and 120 then your champion's 175 and your leader's 205. So you don't really get a lot of numbers on the board until you start adding some territories and can filter in, you know, maybe some, you know, some additional creatures or you know, more mirror blades or mindbound rather to you know get some supplement with numbers. So you're at a disadvantage to start with in terms of numbers typically and uh, and have to work on balancing your attacks and damage to your your inability to survive for a long period of time <laughs> if you get hit you're likely going down at one or two hits so do you guys have any yeah durability thank you that was the word i was looking for <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, uh, i definitely like you were saying i mean i feel like uh, mobility being being able to be someplace that your opponent can't predict um you know you're not necessarily running in a straight line or moving things pieces in a straight line um and you know with that with that teleport and then i feel like there's a few other tricks um uh, especially with that that two inch range is something that not every army has that um kind of that infrequent that that much not every army has access to that much range and kind of um, how, how you know, like making that the other person spend uh, an action to just get in, move an inch to get within range, you know, uh, which yep. is highly frustrating in a good way. Like it's good to have that kind of cost um, on the table, but um, but yeah, I mean, and I, they just they definitely feel like a very ethereal force, or like the the being able to jump over things and just be where you where you can't necessarily plan that they can't be like you might, a lot of this game is thinking like, okay, if I go here, my opponent can't get here or they can't get me over here or vice versa. If they're there, I can do this and this to get to them. So when you have that kind of ability to not have, you don't have to telegraph where you're going with these guys. And that can help a lot with where you're on the table and eluding or trapping your opponent. Yeah, no, so in terms of some of the tactics, you know, just like as Eric had touched on, I think the some of the biggest tactics I use are, are the shadowy recall to move a model, you know, perhaps in the missions where one of my models has grabbed the objective, I can I can use my luminate or thrall master essentially to slingshot them farther away from the enemy so they can't get cop- captured. I can also pull models that might have come on in later rounds and bring them in closer so they have more time to participate in the battle and help me out. Uh, I use the two-inch range to, again, as Eric said, move forward and attack, but deny the the enemy the ability to attack twice without moving first. But, um, but it also allows me to teleport a model into combat or into base-to-base or into a range of another model that may have already acted during the turn, and then they'll still get their two rounds of actions. And so... It, it's been extremely beneficial to have that mobility, both to escape the opponent and or to get into combat with your opponent, and um, and potentially get away. Or the fly can be really useful to hop up onto the second level quickly, without slowing you down, and get away from other models or get to other models. So I found I've 
really enjoyed having that mobility or those options. And uh, I have to admit, it's going to be really interesting when I start playing some different war bands on how how to learn to do without those <laughs> unique mobility approaches. You know, like I played Iron Golems a few times to help people out, and it, it's certainly very different play style. So, but uh, but I do enjoy the the hard hitting, fast hitting uh, mobility of the Cypher Lords. So with uh, with that mobility, specifically the I mean the Shadow Recall is a shadowy recall is one of those again we've talked about as a high um use uh ability it is a triple so that means that you're not getting it every time but i mean you usually have the ability to get a double so you put you know you put your um wild dice uh you know as a to to bring it up to a triple um Mm -hmm. but it also is one of those that requires you to know the like the high you want a high value um on that dice in order to get the most out of it how are you know the the requirement for that is within 12 inches to be able to grab that minion and then it, you can set them up anywhere within that dice uh the number of that dice in inches mm-hmm. what are some of the you know someone might feel like that's like a like we've been talking about from from Haven in my perspective it's an auto included it's an auto grab you always do that are there any cases in which uh, you you know what makes it the hardest thing to use of the army, or or, or what goes into making that work for you? Uh, remembering how close or which one you want. Do you think about which one you want to be able to project, or is it kind of like at the point where you're making a decision, you're like, okay, who do I have? Right, the mix of those, and uh, it really comes down to the mission and uh, what models are available when. You know, because I found that there are cases where, um. You know, as I had mentioned, these are these are expensive models, so they're often the case where you're outnumbered, which usually means that your opponent has more activations. So if I'm going to shadowy recall somebody into combat, I have to be really careful not to do it into combat with someone who hasn't acted yet or close enough to where my opponent could easily move in and just kill that model potentially and negate my whole potential advantage. So it, it takes a little bit to decide, okay... Do I spend my whole turn running with my Luminate and or double moving with my Luminate or my Thrallmaster to bring a model in closer? Or or maybe I need to use them in another way. So it, it can be challenging at times to figure out when to use it. Um, but I found that if I can force my opponent to activate you know, certain models close to a key combat, then I can move a model in there and maybe take out one of their models with that Shadow Recall and double activation. Um, it can be really helpful. One of the other tricks to that uh, with the Shattery Recall is obviously if you don't roll a triple, then you're kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, the 12-inch range can be a liability. The, the good news is there are a lot of artifacts, uh, both quest-related or in the lesser artifact table, that either extend the range of the, the dice ability. So you can add one to your die roll. So if I had a five, yeah. I, could, I could move them within six. But there's also one of the artifacts related to the quests that allow you to bring a model from anywhere on the board instead of within 12 inches and and put it within you know close to your thrall master or your luminate. Um, so so those can be quite quite nice to have. I think it's really nice that the thrall master and the luminate have this ability, and I think yeah. that's why I always include my thrall master and my dagger and or in my shield and my luminate and my dagger. So I always have. The potential in two different groups so i think that's one key consideration to think about for a tactical challenge as well and you're saying uh, dagger and shield because those are more often round one on the board yep yeah and there have been times where i've thought okay i've gotten several territories is it worth having another luminant so that i could put one in each and you know but 175 points is that's a lot of models i could have two different models instead of one and I found having more activations to be more beneficial in that sense. But yeah. yeah. So we kind of talk about the tactics there. And, you know, since all of these warbands have really unique models, we kind of discuss favorite models. And uh, um, I'll let Paven take this one off, go to Eric, and then myself. Okay. My favorite model uh, in this range is the. I don't know, uh, Josh, maybe you can tell me which one this one is. I don't know if it's a mind bound or like the one up from there. Um, but it's the two swords, one, uh, one back behind his back and one reverse grip in the front. Yep. Um, do you know, 
yeah, it's got a great kind of I like I like that like specialty grip uh, pose in miniatures, and it really like like kind of reveals a lot of like, ooh, this guy's really tricky. Like he doesn't even you know grip his sword the regular way. Um, and I think you you can imagine that 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 guy uh, like kind of spinning the whole, the sword around the wrist or doing really a lot of great acrobatics. And I really like uh, that one. Do you know which um, what the name of that one is? Yeah, I think that's Airplane? the mindbound. Yep. Or is it just a mindbound? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so which which is not yet. Yeah, there's a mindbound and a mirror blade, both with dual swords, and they have one less attack, or they have one more attack rather than the ones with the the two inch reach. But yeah, that one is a really dynamic model. It happened to be the first one I painted. So yeah, my actually was one of the other mindbound. Uh, it was the first I painted as well, and that's the one um, holding the blade in its right hand, uh, reverse grip, and a shuriken in the left hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of crouching down, you know, getting low and one leg uh, bent, one leg forward, kind of pointing forward, ready to kind of pounce or jump or something. And uh, I don't know, it's just it's a it's more static than some of like the up on one foot, which were also really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just has this kind of low to the ground, ready to pounce that I really liked. Uh, yeah, and definitely. I, obviously we all like a couple of the other bigger ones, but I'm going to leave those to Josh. All right. Well, thank you. No, no, I have to, I have to say the Thrallmaster is my favorite and not, you know, he's got a very dynamic, you know, the flowing potions, the smoke and the, in the fan, but what's unique. And those of you that have the Cypher Lords will know that that fan is hiding a secret. He's got a third hand holding some alchemical potions beneath the robe. He is the only chaos warband member with a mutation and it makes him really unique, I think. And, uh, kind of, plays to his confident stance i think definitely a unique unique fun trait can i give out like i like that model a lot too my interpretation was that it's a dummy arm like the one the arm that's holding the fan is a fake arm and its real arm is underneath kind of like the old the old trick gun under the table (laughs) Uh, but that i mean i think there's room for both interpretations and like whatever your thermal monster is can be is correct but that's kind of the way i was looking at it like he's a Real tricky trickster. Uh, you know, he's not even giving you his real real arm. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. I agree. Awesome. No, I think and uh, it kind of touched on the, the, again, the models are unique. The mirror bound, the mind blades, the luminate, and the thrall master. And uh, the main differences between the, the two inch range weapons is they typically have uh, one extra damage on the crit roll, but they have one less attack. But otherwise, the stats of the mirror blades are all, you know, strength four. And the stats of the mind bound are all strength three. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's good to have a mix of those two. I think when you're in, when you're in the playing your first games. Yeah. Um, but I think from here, uh, Pavin introduced a really neat idea of talking about narrative takes and modeling opportunities for this particular warband. So I'm going to let him take that off. Yeah, I just really like to think about, especially in work, all in all in Games Workshop uh, products and armies. I like to think of like what would be my take or twist on it. But I think it's especially fun for Warcry because it's such kind of a focused narrative space. Is like what direction could this warband go in, or like what twist would I put on it, or what story would I try to tell? And I thought we could just uh, kind of a free wheel around our ideas about. Um, the cipher lords and like kind of what who who our cipher lords would be just some kicking some ideas around um i would start by i think the one of the easiest uh exercises to kind of go through is you know as this war band marches along the path of glory like which god you know proper chaos god would they would they become marked by like well what are their tendencies that would be exploited I think one of the best places to start with when thinking about Warcry Warbands and like putting your own twist on them is like maybe start heading them down the path of path to glory towards one of the gods. Like they don't know they've been marked, but they've been subtly marked by the favor of Korn or Zinch or Slamesh or Nurgle. Um, and it's a fun little exercise to be like, what fault or what tendency does this warband had that would be that one of the gods could take advantage of and lead them to kind of further down the, the path of damnation. Um, so a, a few of my ideas I would like to throw out there, especially I think they are a slam dunk for Zinch, the Cypher Lords, just being their obsession with plots 
and intrigue and spying. These are all in the like kind of the machinations of Zinch, the fate master. And so I think that's a natural fit. I think that's the way Josh took them. Um, I think everybody, it's very easy to fall to corn in the, uh, in the worlds of Warhammer because he is a war God and a God of battle and bloodshed. And this is a battle game. And so I don't think it's much of a stretch is like a group of the cypher Lords really getting into like, uh, kind of martial prowess and, you know, martial arts and Kung Fu and just really kind of hyper focused on that until they become, you know, only about the fighting and the fighting for the sake of the fighting. And then they, the bloodthirst takes over. Um, I was the last one I really want to talk about, probably my favorite. Um, I was really struggling to think about how the cypher Lords would fall to Nurgle, um, kind of Nurgle being um, sloth and decay and kind of that kind of those kind of gross and like enduring tendencies and didn't see like a slam dunk. But I think what I came up with, which is like an interest and maybe an interesting take is, um, the Cypher Lords have a tendency to use poisons and, um, and also they, the, if, in, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the leaders will mind slave their, their kind of minions and like kind of bend them to their will. Um, and I think there's a long history in Nurgle about like zombification and turning people into like plague zombies that kind of don't have minds and they just kind of shuffle forward. And so I think leaning hard into that kind of voodoo, like turning humans into living zombies and doing that through some kind of poisonous cocktail could be and like, you know, rotting their minds with um, magic and sorcery. I think that is a direction where you could have a Cypher Lord warband kind of have a very nurglish flavor to them that I think would be co- a cool area to explore. Um, I like that. Um, yeah, I like I like that idea of puppet master of uh, uh, you know pulling the strings and I'm, <laughs> it made me think that even even uh, you know if you don't go zombies, I wonder if you can even go like I was trying to think if I could make uh, like fishing string tied around their hands and ankles and have it uh, like glue it so that it points straight up into nothing, uh-huh. right? So that there's oh, like they're... like they're marionettes. Um, yeah, you know, and so that like the throw masters like controlling them almost literally, um, and you just model them with the impression that they're, that they're kind of, they've got that little hand above them somewhere, you know, moving them around. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if this would be possible to, to actually sculpt it in like a miniature or like have it come across, but if that hidden hand could be the one pulling the strings. Sure. That would be very interesting. I don't think it would be really hard to express on like on that scale, but well, what you would yeah. you would do is you take the thrall master who looks like they have no strings, and mm-hmm. you put a string on that little hand, uh, and and it kind of unknown even to to him or her uh, that their strings are being pulled as well. Uh, but no, I like that. I like that idea. Um, would you? And and I, I I think you're right. The whole zombie thing, like how. Because these models are, are healthy. <laughs> yeah, these, yeah. You know, they've got uh, athletic builds. Uh, they are um, uh, they are quite honed, right? They're they're you know in that regard. How could you? Uh, I suppose a, a sickly skin tone um, or something like that. How else could you take kind of pock them up or um, you know do that kind of thing to make them look more zombie like? Um. Well, just the thoughts off the top of my head are like head swaps. You can just head swap that whole warband to make it more like kind of a listless dead eyes on the on the on the thralls um, would be a cool way to do that. You can also like make it so like, I don't know, the head is rotting inside of the mask. So they've been like so poisoned and sick that there's like nothing going on in there anymore. And maybe uh... the mask is corroding itself or maybe you can see the skin around their neck is diseased in a way. Um, yeah. So, however, like the 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 mind control potion is administered has like a corrosive effect on them as well. Yeah, sure. You could do little disease marks, so you know, like bruises and things on the skin. You know, even though it looks healthy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like but uh, you also you had also suggested a Slanesh association, which I don't think you touched on, but but the 
opulence and luxury and, and drugs and control through alchemical means, which which I think was also a, a fun twist. And in the short story in the anthology, it talks about addiction and how some of them are addicted to what the Thrallmaster gives them to help them fight better. And they and they need to have those, you know, alchemical supplements. So definitely. Yeah. I think I think when I painted mine, uh, regardless of it being kind of a, a magenta uh, color scheme, I was definitely looking for something that was like emphasizing the beauty of, um, you know, the gowns of the thrall master and patterns and that sort of stuff. So I definitely like that. I, I, I like that idea of Slanesh being kind of, uh, you know, uh, where you'd said like the martial perfection could be more corn, um, but, uh, kind of performance aspect of it that you're doing more showy moves or distraction moves in the, in the, you know, you're, doing something big and um, you know showy over here and that could be for a distraction over someplace else or it could be just to kind of show off and be you know very big and bold with your movements to um, you know on ego and skill and all that kind of stuff and so having the thrall master be very showy and, and easy to find or easy to like stands out uh, would be an interesting side of that compared to the zinch side where maybe they're trying to be hidden or um, not as um, as much of a target on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. And, and just so you guys know, the the theme I kind of went with is more of a generic madness. And so if you get if you hold the models closer enough, you'll see that there are tentacles that are painted onto their uh, loincloths or the robes at the bottom. So it's more of a Cthulhu esque madness sort of theme. And um, after I read the Shadespire book, wait, uh, wait, Josh, can I can I make a joke without uh, talking over you in the podcast? <laughs> hey, of course. Is that a tentacle on your loincloth? Or are you happy to see me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't think it was worth it, but go on. <laughs> um, but um, for for people who may have may or may not have read the Shadespire uh, book. It, it talks about uh, the, some of the characters that are in Shadespire between the realms of light and shadow uh, see other beings moving in the void. And uh, so I think that was a kind of a fun throw to, you know, some of those far realm deities of D&D or Cthulhu-esque type things. So I definitely think my war band uh, perhaps worships or entertains the attentions of some of those deities that just want to spread madness. Yeah. Um, did you see anybody do anything interesting with alternate um, headdresses or um, crests? Is it, I have, yeah. What, yeah. what kinds so, of things have you seen out there? Uh, some people just did head swaps completely and maybe, you know, mixed up some, uh, you know, either Dark Elf or other uh, Dark Eldar heads, just so you had some more face or skin to show uh some people also just removed the uh the ponytail so you had just the masks some people left the the pointy mask but removed i guess the brim i guess you would call it but left the ponytail you know so people have done quite a few different things and they've all looked really interesting i think so because i'm trying to think i think these guys could look really cool with stormcast heads and the crests that come on those Mm -hmm. um or, uh, you know, instead of the, um, there could be, what is the, is it Hellraiser is the guy with the mask with like the spikes coming out of it? Right. Yeah. That's that Hellraiser. could, that could be kind of crazy here if you had like, uh, took off the crest, like cut it. So you still have their masks on, but you have these points coming out or, or spikes coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the daughters of Cain, um, elf heads, yeah. uh, with their flowing hair would be pretty fantastic for these models. Yep. Um, to kind of just show more movement, it'd be tricky to get you know the right hair flow uh, for, for the, the right model, right? Uh, yeah, some people um, have used those some of those heads, and they do look nice. But those could also be, um, besides those being very dagger heavy, um, could be interesting counts as to have even more flowy and jumpy kind of models. But mm-hmm. um, anything else in terms of uh, taking a different take on these guys uh you know paven if you were to do these would you would you pick the would you go that route of the the zombies um that would be the idea i'm most excited about um because i think it's like it's like the most interesting um but i don't know i don't know i'm pretty far away from uh yeah. starting a <laughs> yeah 
here, and so yeah. I'd have to see what, what strikes. Oh me. no, nobody's nobody's committing you to anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, yeah, it's also like what's really great about playing any of the cast bands. You have a, like a huge selection from of mercenaries and monsters to expand your your war band with. Yeah. Um, so that would also be a consideration is like what additional um, chaos march specific um, models do I want to add to my war band? Do I want a slaughter priest or do I want a um, like a, a blight lord or whatever? Uh, what's the name of the of the Nurgle lord? Because um, that would be the that would be the direction right. I would additionally extend. Um, kind of, if I was going to theme the Cypher Lords with a specific god in mind, I'd want to expand with kind of, you know, they start attracting a certain type of uh, of mercenary. Um, mm-hmm. I think another way to go with the corn, um, the martial perfection, like, um, and this is probably somewhat similar, which may be hard not to be to the Katsuni theme that you did, Josh, but like a Kabuki, um, yeah. uh, theme would be really cool with bright reds, um, and whites, um, you know, with those, with strong, like markings on the masks and the headdresses, uh, you know, more like that makeup, um, that could be really cool to kind of be very aggressive and, um, you know, kind of, I feel like corn, you'd have to take the masks off too, to some extent. Um, because corn isn't about subterfuge or, um, you know, they're pretty straightforward. So I wonder if that, that's an interesting dynamic with these guys with the masks are so iconic. Um, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but then, and, you, you know, know, a lot of the corn warriors were helmets though, that you can't see their face anyway. So. I guess that's a loophole. There you go. Um, for sure. Um, Josh, you know, Paven brought up a good point um, in t- talking about themes or having this army do different things. Were there any allies that uh, that you brought on board or, or fielded much with these guys? Uh, I have not fielded any allies yet. Uh, and part of that is because Shadowy Recall is such an iconic ability for these models and it only works for their minions. So I found that tactically, it's been more beneficial to have more models from my own faction on the table. However, um, I am drawn to a lot of the Zinch models. Uh, you know, one of the weaknesses that the, the Cypher Lords have um, are, you know, having some models with additional you know, wounds, more wounds, or some ranged attacks. So I thought bringing maybe some of those Zinch models for some some of that uh, spell casting range would be helpful. Also, the War Queen and the, the Dark Oath Chieftain both have a lot of wounds and some decent attacks, so I thought they might also be able to supplement in the wound department and help draw attention. But I have not yet tried any yet. But uh, those are some of the, those are some of the ones I'm thinking about. Okay, very cool. Who who's your go to for for putting out the most damage? That's a good question. It really depends. It it tends to be the Luminant, I think, just because she's she's got 15 wounds, so she lasts a little longer than the rest, and she has a two inch range. So the the Thrallmaster has the same number of attacks, the same strength. He's got one additional damage on the crit, but he's a one inch range versus her two inch range. But uh, so yeah, we'll have to wait and see. And of course, the Thrallmaster being the leader gets picked on more than the champ, so so he tends to get taken <laughs> out sooner. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other um, kind of questions on these guys or or things that um, you know? Uh, were you? This was the first army you picked, Josh. Um, you know, out of the, out of the gate, and and you've stuck with them through since it came out. You've been playing these guys a lot. Mm-hmm. What has What's been the number one thing that's 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 kept you with them? Um, you know, it, were they everything you thought they would be? Did they um, were they a little bit more adjustment than you thought but it would be? Kind of what's been what's been keeping you on the Cipher Lord train? Um, is it them or is it the mastery of it? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I think um, it was the themes that kind of brought me to them in the first place, and I think really keeps me in it. Um, I also haven't finished painting up the whole warband, which I really want to do. Um, so that's, that's also kind of keeping me going. But I think the evolving story, and the ideas, um, you know, as we get drawn into it narratively, have been a lot of fun. Uh, I am looking forward to, to trying some new stuff now that the cards are coming out soon. But, uh, but I definitely am 
still really drawn to the particular martial themes and spreading madness. And I think if I decide to build a Slaves of Darkness army, it would kind of be based on those themes in particular, and the Cypher Lords would be involved in that. So Very cool. Very cool. We're going to go ahead and take another break, and when we come back, we're going to chat about the Untamed Beasts. Hey, look who it is. I recognize you. Saw you out in the spoils. I didn't actually think you'd make it to the Discord channel. If you run into Dos Asos and he asks you a question, answer quick, but don't make eye contact. He'll take it as a challenge. The scrying pit is uh, over there where we sit around the fire telling tall tales. Take a load off. But if you're still here at breakfast, best be ready to join the warband or you'll be staying as lunch. <laughs> and we're back to talk about the Untamed Beasts. And I'm pretty excited about this because I was not expecting uh, to fall in love with these guys. Um, uh, the Untamed Beasts were the f- one of two first armies that we or warbands that were revealed when the Warcry starter box. And the Warcry game in general was uh, revealed and and released. So it was one of the first warbands we could get our hands on. And the things that, uh, for me, the first appearance and impressions had to do with some of those Conan the Barbarian feels you get with them. Mm -hmm. They're covered in leathers and furs, horns, horned helmets, bone armor, bone weapons, etc., a lot muscles. of uh, a lot of muscles, um, and you know, for me, that was one of the first fantasy worlds that I I jumped into, which was you know the Conan the Barbarian world, um, and so these guys appealed. Not to mention having a, a, one of the first animals as a part of the war band, which adds a lot of character, um, and so there was that. When given the choice in that setting between the Iron Golems, you know these what looked like big. Um, sturdy but more stoic fighters and the untamed beast which looked like you know running jumping uh prowling uh fighters that's what i gravitated towards um uh, paven what was your first impression of these guys what did you like or or not like about them uh these guys definitely hit the gym uh they're not skipping leg day they're doing they have good splits and they're taking their supplements um well, that was probably my they're definitely a, mu- a muscle bunch war band um uh yeah very cool group of guys it was you know they were the first along with the iron golems they were the one of the first um factions teased for war cry so it really gave us an idea of like what the tone of the game would be and kind of what narrative space it was going to exist in um yeah, cool stuff. I like I like the realm of beasts, and these guys seem to definitely fit in there. I don't know if I have a as as elaborate of a story as I do about the cipher lords. For sure. How about you, Josh? Yeah, no, a, a lot of things about them appealed to me. I thought, uh, you know, I thought they that they some aspects of them have this hunter gatherer, you know, feel, and uh, I've got some Native American heritage, and so this kind of fit. I was like, oh yeah, these would be a really great Native American. Her- war band it also they also got this kind of punk rocker uh rat <laughs> skin you know feel for necromunda war band which i also have which i thought was really cool but uh but you know as you touched on you know i, I really enjoyed a lot of the the conan and barbarian stories i've read them all i've seen all the movies this fits right in there and and i thought they'd be really fun painted up with some celtic warrior themes and other stuff you know there are lots of really nice things about them that captured my interest to begin with you know. Well, cool. Well, I want to hear more about that that idea a little bit later. Um, so let's talk about what drives them, their ideals. And I'm also going to read um, their entry from the core rulebook. Uh, and it says here, The untamed beasts are a nomadic tribe that hunt across the jagged savanna in Gur. Predatory and shamanistic, they prey solely upon other carnivores, devouring the flesh of savage meat-eating creatures in order to gain their strength and cunning. They see chaos as the devourer of existence and Archeon as the eater of worlds, and they long to join in his hunt. Each member of the Untamed Beast carries pelts and fetishes of the predators they've consumed, and through profane oaths they bind the spirits of these creatures to their own being, allowing them preternaturally bursts of animal ferocity. 
these primal warriors despise those who display any sign of civilization, such as establishing permanent settlements or wearing forge-crafted armor. To them, such behavior is merely deluded weakness, for nothing of mortal make can survive the wrath of the devourer, and to pretend otherwise is a grand blasphemy. The skins of those they have slain are strung from trees, along with crude banners, while the butchered and bloody carcasses are left to rot. And their theme, uh, or motto, is Hunt the Hunter. So there are two stories that uh, that came in the anthology. The Devourer is Demand, and this is a story of a plains runner, uh, which is the lowest level of the tribe, um, kind of stepping and, and sh- hitting above their their uh, their weight, uh, trying to prove themselves, kind of out of turn, and they're kind of we find out what ended up driving them to this extreme. And then they appear as kind of a second um, warband or the the opposing warband in the eight-tailed naga, uh, where they kind of pop out of the sand as an ambush, uh, which is an interesting take on them as well. Um, they don't fare as well in that in that second one. Um, but in these stories, they do live a very um, tribe-oriented lifestyle. There's a hierarchy. Uh, and that hierarchy, uh, you know, we can go into it later in terms of, you know, the models and, and stuff and such like that. But the, the plains runners are at this lowest level. They're kind of the scouts. I always imagined them as this kind of force that goes out, finds out where the prey is, finds out where the tribes are. You know, maybe they die <laughs> getting that information back and often only one of them makes it back. You know, the epitome of the buddy system. There are the prey takers, which... Um, kind of come off as underling heart eaters. Uh, they're kind of um, kind of a step up. They're warriors. They've got helmets and and uh, horns. Um, there's the first fang, which is a kind of a spear chucking uh, fighter with a uh, rope tied to that, so we can uh, kind of pull things back to him. And then there's the beast speaker, who has this large whip, mainly in kind of control of the animals or or oversees the the different beasts that. Uh, fight and hunt with them uh, and that the one of the that model that's in in the warband is the rock tusk prowler which is a a lion sort of uh, figure with um, goat horns uh, etc and spiny tail and then at the top of the food chain is the heart eater uh, who is the strongest the best fighter um, and uh, kind of leader of the group though in one of the stories and, and in this description they talk about a shamanistic uh, in one of the stories, there's also a shaman who is uh, a partial leader of the group or maybe a counselor to the heart eater. Um, and so I, I can imagine that being something that comes down the road or something that if you were to add a magic user into the warband as an ally, that'd be an interesting take. Uh, and the, that dichotomy, it's very interesting at times they talk about, you know, again, tearing down society. At the same time, there's a there's some aspects of group and and hierarchy where they like there's a hierarchy where it feels like there should be less hierarchy um i don't know what do you guys think about about this aspect of them uh in terms of their you know uh rage against the machine no no that's fair i think um i like the tribal hierarchy because i you know again it kind of pulls on those uh native american tribal uh war band type type feeling and and i think it fits well here that you know everybody has their role you know you've got your shamanistic you got your warrior leader you've got your you know uh younger members of the tribe who are trying to prove themselves and become you know become adults become the warrior so i always thought that was a really neat dynamic but um but yeah there's some of the short stories from the war cry anthology kind of play on that theme a little bit and twist it but I don't want to give away what that what that is. But uh, I definitely like the tribal hierarchy. Yeah. So the Great Devourer specifically uh, is their kind of uh, their god or their version of chaos. This is what they see them in this constant eating and uh, you know devouring and 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 conquering of things. Um, it, you know, in one of the stories, uh, the eyes of their devourer or whoever that ends up being even turn their head towards. Uh, the very inspire and command them to tear those walls down. Uh, yeah. And so there's an interesting duality of like, on one hand they, they do revere Archeon and want to join that hunt. Uh, 
but it also seems like they could be a very anti um, uh, Archaeon sort of force as well. I can't tell whether the Untamed Beasts know the least amount about, like, kind of the bigger picture or the most. Like, they, you know, worshipping chaos as some big beast eating everything up is, like, kind of missing kind of the whole modern army mechanized kind of nature of Archeon's conquest and, like, kind of the, the, the... the kind of civilization building aspect that is necessary to have any kind of large uh, realm spanning conflict. Like you're not going to do that with a bunch of nomadic tribes and like kind of throwing away like forged weapons seems a little silly, right? Like, like what, like how are these guys supposed to get, you know, a seat at the big kids table? But on the other hand, like, you know, the, the end game of chaos is kind of just devolving everything into like, into, into just hell and like <laughs> ruining, you know, and like, you know, it, and then everything else is just steps along the way. So maybe they really got it. Like, you're <laughs> right. Like, chaos is just going to like eat everything up and it's all going to be the realm of chaos again. Um, and I was like, well, okay. I don't right, know. Right. Primordial soup. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, look, I get, I get your fancy armaments and forges and your machinations, but at the end of the day, you, you hunt it. You kill it, you eat it. Um, <laughs> uh, no, make no, make no bones about it. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Um, no, that's a, that's a very interesting take, and um, you know that I definitely feel like they are potentially just like a weapon that Archeon points at things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as many things are like these guys aren't going to be your strategists, um, but they could certainly be you know tacticians like. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, it took me a little bit to figure about the army. I can talk about a little bit later is that they aren't, they also aren't the point and shoot. Like you don't just throw them all forward and hope that they kill stuff. Uh, they stalk, they wait. Um, so there's a, there is an aspect of their gameplay and their, their hunting that has to do with timing and, you know, striking the heart, right? Um, hitting the right spot. So there's, there's certainly, uh, as we'll talk about here, they, they are, have more utility and there's tools to them as opposed to some army, some other armies where you may need, they just, their job is to go forward and fight and survive and they'll, they, they're durable and they'll put up like the, the iron jaws, for instance, are very much, they take a lot of beating and they dish out a lot of beating. So you can just, run them forward and, and hope they get into battle, right? Mm-hmm. These guys are a little bit different. Um, let's talk a little bit about those the narrative takes. Um, now, uh, they imagine that they're marked by God, uh, the gods, um, and some of these were, were, you know, you guys shared some of these ideas. I put a couple in here as well. The, the idea of the raging berserker, that they are, you know, more feral and... Um, uh, angry. Um, and so I've, I've seen, uh, so that, you know, devoted to corn. Um, and I've seen some armies, uh, some, some war bands of these use, um, the, uh, what are they called? The Wolfen models from 40 K, which the heads from the Wolfen, which are very were- werewolf and fangs and wild hair sort of, um, kind of, uh, direction. So I use some, a lot of space wolf heads, which have <laughs> a very eighties, uh, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger plus cyberpunk, you know, like big hair mohawks kind of feel, um, to give them a little bit of that kind of feral idea, but a less wolf and more just, you know, out to have a good time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and so I think that that fits, you know, kind of a very corn, like, you know, my guys, maybe they're a little bit more uh, college bro, um, uh, than, than the wolfen models. Um, you go to, um, oh, we put that, uh, I didn't see the first one and I, or I saw it and I didn't, anyway, uh, you go to Nurgle and I do like this take on it, uh, this idea of the circle of life, life and death, um, you know, uh, hunting, um, curing, um, you know, and they talk about the end here, some things that they, they keep and some things they let to rot. And, you know, maybe it's that idea you set something out for bait, right? 
you leave some of that rotting and curing, and then something's going to come to eat that, and then you hunt that. Um, well, I think uh, even with the Nurgle theme, you could say, you know, they're eating the hearts of these beasts, so they're kind of perpetuating that cycle of life where they're, they killed it, but they're eating the heart, so they incorporate that aspect of their life and yep. continue the cycle. So. Yep, yep. Um, and then uh, the Slanesh, uh, there's a very interesting aspect to these guys where they're trying to give themselves over to their the kind of the, the beast within uh, and this idea that they're taking in the beast and that they can perform these um, kind of these uh, bursts of animal ferocity so what if in Slanesh you know they're giving fully over to that that carnal desire and so that's you know hunting and uh, you know killing with less regard um, it could be into, you know, just the, the animalistic nature of, of humanity, uh, which I'm not going to go into much more detail. You figure it out. Um, uh, but just, you know, the even more, um, you know, non-human and more animal like, you know, the, you know, the beast speaker is a running forward kind of model. Um, but what if, you know, you could angle it forward even more to where one of her hand is touching the ground so she's you know almost like she's uh running like the rock tusk prowler is um so there'd be interesting things there Mm -hmm. um and then you know with with zinch i guess you could put feathers on them well i think you could go with the aspect (laughs) of aspect of change right you know if they're tearing down society and and all these institutions you're you're changing the world right you're creating chaos by its nature so i think that that feeds into Zinch. I think there could also be, there could be an aspect of, of assassination or, um, uh, you know, hunting that, that, that key figure or something that they do well, that could fit into that. Any of those, uh, or any of uh, those or ideas or other ideas kind of gel with you guys or think that, that stand out for you. I had another idea and I don't know, I wrote it down in the, in the Google doc, uh, which we work from. Um, but I don't know if I stole this from somewhere else. Uh, but, uh, my idea was, um, so not necessarily going by the mark of, by the gods route, but, um, yeah. untamed beasts, but from, uh, Shaman, the realm of metal. And so instead of hunting, like, you know, beasts of flesh and born a uh, bone, they're hunting like clockwork beasts and they're like, you know, you know, destroying them and like the oil goes everywhere and then they have all these metal parts. And so they're fashioning kind of their weapons from metal again, but there's still like the parts of these weird, you know, mechanized kind of uh, creatures that, that mm-hmm. inhabit in the realm of metal. And that would be a really cool like modeling opportunity to give them like, what does a jawbone look like on a, a robot chicken or whatever? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah yeah or, yeah, so or it's uh, like the same slag. themes but it's like kind of a, a twist on it and so that could be fun yeah yeah they're often seen as having bone weapons or obsidian knives but yeah what if it were the, you know the broken pieces of a cog fort or you know it's which is the, kind of the epitome of not just civilization but like over engineering mm-hmm. uh or excessive engineering that's that's super interesting i like that a lot what other kind of uh, prey or something would you guys, you know, Josh, do you have any other prey that could determine who they are? Well, I was just thinking of uh, Paven's idea in, in the new Kahadran Overlord Battle Tome. They talk about Gollum kind as being a race, too. You know, so I was, it just kind of made me think about, oh, maybe if they're killing these elemental entities, maybe their weapons are fashioned from some sort of magical stone or, you know, fluid you know, material, you know, besides just, just metal, it could be some kind of unique stone from these golem kind creatures. Yeah. Uh, what if they, you know, hunted, um, uh, were anti magic, um, you know, magic being, um, I don't know, a perversion of, of, of some sort, you know, or, you know, you can, you very much Conan the barbarian and versus, you know, the, the wizard, um, right. kind of trope. Um, so, you know, maybe they're against Zinch or they're against, you know, that sort of stuff or against Slan, you know, and so you give them more, you know, lizard, uh, cloaks, um, or, you know, um, you've, the Seraphon have a few, um, bone type, um, bits here and there that would be interesting to give them so that they've, you know, they've slayed the, um, the lizard folk and taken away their, you know, yeah. their bones and are using them as weapons. That could oh, be yeah. Or, or using their, you know, their wooden studded clubs or, you know, you can make them very Aztec themed too. I think you're right. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. The the Plains Runner specifically have a very um they they definitely kind of have a, a some of the headdress too, like you talked about the punk rock. Right. But also that that's a very, you know, South American or Central American um kind of vibe as well with clumes or, you know, um you know, that sort of thing. So that that could go very well with that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think with these guys, I, I, I didn't do as much, uh, with their, I didn't like the helmets very much. I felt like helmets were a fashioned thing as opposed to pelts or, you know, ropes. I mean, even a whip is a little bit fashioned, but, um, you know, if you're stealing it off something or whatever, but the helmets felt a little restrictive for me. And so I took those off, um, most, uh, um, the, the, at least the champions and, uh, kind of went with something that was a little bit more feral, a little bit more Conan, uh, with, you know, hair and whatnot. Um, um, but I don't know if I have any, any more ideas out of the gate, um, with these guys, obviously with the pelts and stuff, you can, you can put different patterns and, and have different, uh, kind of markings on them also. Um, but they're, you know, just a, a really cool theme um, that can go even from these a lot of different directions, which I like. Uh, I, I'm definitely uh, a little bit enamored with that clockwork idea, Pavement. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I hope I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but credit to whoever deserves it. Yes. Let's talk a little bit more about mechanics then and how they play on the table and how much fun they are. Way more fun than all these other war bands. Um, <laughs> So uh, some of their abilities, uh, one of the things that I think this army has um, more than some others is utility, uh, Some, which, which means in the case of abilities that some things are only usable by a single model from the warband. Uh, so whereas uh, there's maybe some more warbands where there's a, a, an ability can be used by more than multiple models or, or fighters. Uh, so the first one that is universal is, is uh, Savage Fury, and this adds one to the move characteristic of the fighter for the next move action, and adds one attack characteristic. So it combines Rush and Onslaught uh, from the universal abilities, which is which is really cool. If you want to be able to get a little bit further and uh, you know and attack, that definitely adds some utility. You're spending one double for both of those instead of two doubles, um, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's one of those where that's a bit of an upgrade from the the universal. Um, their double, another double, all out attack, which is only used uh, can be used by the leader, has the leader uh, rune. A fighter can use this ability only if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them. This activation, this fighter makes a bonus move action or bonus attack action. So that means that if your leader takes out a fighter. And then they can spend a double. They can na- make another move and attack. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. So it's like Rampage, only it has a requirement. So it's like Rampage, only costs a double, but it requires uh, taking out a fighter in that in that activation. Uh, but that's really cool. Now we get into a few of the more even more unique, the double Beastmaster. Uh, pick a friendly fighter with the beast rune mark within four inches of this fighter, and that fighter makes a bonus attack action. So that's uh, the Rock Tusk Prowler. It can be the um, Raptorix, or it can be the Fury, I believe. Um, I'll have that beast mark. Um, so that's some interesting versatility outside of the faction. Um, there's a triple pounce, which can be performed by the Rock Tusk Prowler. Until the end of this fighter's activation, the next time this fighter finishes a move action within one inches of an enemy fighter, pick a visible enemy fighter within one inch of this fighter and allocate a number of damage points to that fighter equal to the value of this ability. So it's kind of a run in and just do an amount of damage equal to the dice uh, after a move. Um, the the next is also a triple, and this is where, again, some more, uh, more utility. Um, and this one can be performed by the first fang. Uh, called Harpoon Snag. This fighter makes a bonus attack action. After that attack action, the fighter targeted by the attack action makes a bonus move action directly towards this fighter as if they were jumping a number of inches equal to the value of this ability. So we make an extra attack 
regardless of whether or not we uh, do damage, we pull them uh, the number of inches equal to that dice. And mm-hmm. so it's, uh, you harpoon them, you stick them, and you drag them back. Uh, and then the last one is a quad and can be used by anyone uh, on the, in the army, which is uh, super interesting. Unleash the beast until the end of the battle round. Add half of the value of this ability. Round it up to the attack, attacks and strength characteristic of attack actions made by this fighter that have a range characteristic of three or less. And I realized as I'm reading this that I've uh, likely cheated with this a couple of times uh, by until the end of the battle instead of the battle round. Uh, so, um, but so those are the the abilities. Um, and so that means, so there's a few things in there where you get a little value from that Savage Fury. We're pulling in Russian Onslaught. And then there's a, a few cases where you're picking, uh, the Beastmaster and the Rock Tusk Prowler as a, as a common pair, uh, to be able to do the, um, the Beastmaster and give them an extra attack and stuff like that. Um, so those are the abilities. Uh, now let's talk about, uh, the fighters. Uh, as we mentioned, kind of the, um, the, there's some things about this too that, that, that work really well for the army or that feel right, uh, right and good. And that is the first fighter, the planes runner, which is the cheapest unit. Uh, it's 55 points. And as you would expect in a tribe of, of untamed beasts are likely to be the most, potentially be the most numerous on the battlefield. And, um, play the role of both low cost bodies and activations. Uh, they play the role of, uh, kind of running. They have a five inch move. They're only eight wounds. So they, they die fairly easily, uh, uh strength th- or toughness three. Um, but mostly they're there to either, uh, grab an objective early, uh, move quickly to do that. You know, if you give them rush, they're moving, um, 12 inches. Um, uh, and, uh, maybe to pick off a wound here and there because their attacks are low. They get three attacks, which isn't bad. So you're shooting for sixes, trying to pick off a wound here and there from an enemy uh, fighter. Um, I'll often use them as kind of blocks. So go up and, and tag a, a fighter and try and make them waste an activation, uh, trying to kill them or move around them or disengage. Um, the next one I will, um, honest to goodness, have not fielded a prey taker. Um, Partially because of the helmets, <laughs> partially because of movement four, um, they do have a couple extra wounds, um, and they have uh, stronger attacks. They have four attacks and and at strength three uh, versus three attacks at strength three. It just doesn't often what the the if i'm choosing between them and the planes runners the planes runners just bring a bit more utility i can get a few more on the table and have them move around give me activations and do that sort of thing so the prey takers feel like they're just a little expensive for me in terms of filling that same kind of role now that being said i would i have a few that i would i would love to try and, and run them at some point with um some more of those kind of run behind the heart eater but again they're kind of slow so i'm i'm a little bit reluctant um, the next then we get to the rock tusk prowler which is um, f- nice. is an absolute fantastic model it has 8 inches of movement so it can be in a lot of places on the board it's not as fast uh, You know, we, there's a few 10 inch move uh, models or fighters in other war bands but uh, 8 inches is really fast and uh, it has an attack profile uh, the same as the heart eater so it's a four attacks, strength four, two, five. Um, it's still only toughness four. And that's one thing that you'll find in this army is that everything's a little bit of a punching bag uh, and will just will go down fairly easily, meaning that if your opponent's um, leader or champion gets into them for sure, uh, you know they can take down your fighters fairly easily. So movement, getting out of the way, uh, being able to do some different things is really good. Um, and one of the best things again is that the beast speaker ability who will come next, the beast speaker has the ability to give the rock test prowler an extra attack. So if you have to yeah. move 
your Rock Tusk Prowler to be able to get in range to attack something. And you're like, oh, I've only got, I wish I could do that twice. Well, the Beast Speaker, Beast Speaker can come over and help him do that. Now, sometimes that feels like the Beast Speaker's best thing to do. Um, the Beast Speaker is a five inch move, has a range four attack which can be really good, similar to the range two stuff where you can just kind of tag somebody who's up on a ledge or, uh, you know, um, you know, a little ways away and stays out of reach, but they're fairly weak attacks. So it's a little bit of just trying to pick off wounds. So at the end of the day, often what she's doing is being a force multiplier for the rock test prowler. Um, and, uh, you know, th- that's not bad. It's not a bad thing to take, you know, uh, your, one of your better units and, and make them, you know, more useful. Um, the second to the top is the first Fang, I guess, because first is in the name. Uh, the first Fang is our, has an eight inch reach weapon, uh, that they harpoon and snag and drag people off. Um, and I would say I, I like to include this guy about 50% of the time. So I'll, I almost always bring in the rock test prowler cause of that movement and that, uh, those attacks, the, or two, or in the last few games, three, um, <laughs> to try. Because one of the things the army doesn't do well overall, if you just have a one of everything, it doesn't have a lot of um, ability to kill things. Um, again, if the Rock Tusk Prowler is moving to be able to get someplace and kill something, it's got one chance. Uh, and so, and then can easily be killed back if they're ganged up on or, or whatnot. So in missions like you know, killing things, the rock tusk prowler, the heart eater are the best at that, but can't always get the job done. And so some of these abilities boost that to make them stronger. Um, but the, the thing that the, the first Fang has going for them is they have that attack that lets them pull things away. And I think anytime you can change your opponent's movement, it's pretty cool. Like we're, we're always looking to knock people off of, um, off of uh, ledges and stuff. And because oh, yeah. that, that move is a jump, you can pull people off of ledges. And that's probably one of the ways I use this model the most. He's awesome in objective play. He's fantastic at being able to, especially if he's uh, you leave him towards a final activation in the battle round, he can uh, kind of have that free reign to take, uh, once your opponent has done enough things and all that they can do, and you yank that model out of uh, position, they no longer have that objective, and uh, it just kind of changes your outcomes very easily. Uh, well, I won't say very easily. Um, you still have to get that triple, uh, but it's it's definitely one of those that has won me a game here and there. Um, you know, definitely, about... yeah. yeah. You used it to good effect in several games, including against me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, gotta you gotta. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, is the Heart Eater, who is your leader. Uh, he has got the most wounds with 20, similar as the Rock Tusk Prowler. Um, he has a five inch move and uh, has uh, is definitely between the two of them a target for um, Unleash the Beast and for all, you know, and this guy has all that attack where if he takes somebody down, he can make another um, uh, move and attack um, for, for a double. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, th- this guy, though. Because he's still fairly easy to kill at 20 wounds and 4 toughness, I often put him in my hammer and he comes in a little bit later, which means that he's not on the board as long to do as much work. Um, Whenever I've brought him in on the dagger or the shield to come in first or be at the center of the board where he wants to get in a fight, um, if activations don't go well, he gets ganged up on and he gets taken out. Uh, And so he's a leader that I often feel the need to protect a little bit until he can become a little bit more, you know, ragey and get more damage in. And then, then I like to, to put him on things. Um, so yeah, you know, you get, you have uh, a lot of speed five models. Um, you have, especially that rock tusk prowler at a speed eight. So getting to objectives, getting to, uh, you know, kind of chasing things down, um, you know, that's your model to go to damage for the kill missions, the heart eater and the rock tusk prowler, uh, backed up by the B speaker are a great way to take down models to get extra attacks in, in a, in a turn, uh, or take your most effective attacks and get more of them in. 
Um, and then durability, man, uh, I think the durability of this army comes in having, <laughs> uh, and this is where I think it talk about, uh, you know, like ha- trying to be a little bit more cunning and, uh, act like a hunter, uh, having more planes runners on the table, um, so that you can decide when to apply. Like if you have the enough activations to kind of control that and give, give your right pieces the, the right time to strike. Um, that's very helpful. Um, you know, get them to tie up your enemy models so that they can't be as effective on that turn so that when I come in with my B speaker or my rock tusk prowler, I'm more effective. Um, uh, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a, those are, those are some of just the rundown of those. Um, what are some, does, does all of that ring true to you guys? Is, do I, am I underplaying any one of these models, uh, too much, uh, or fighters? Uh, what, what were some of yours, as you've played against these guys, what are the ones that stood out to you as must kills or, you know, um, MVPs? Um, can I, can I go back to the abilities real quick? Mm-hmm. Sure can. Um, so re- this is the first time I think I've actually read through all of the untamed beast ability card and these are super strong. I think I didn't, um, like you have a lot of really good, really good abilities on here. You got a lot of free, um, actions or like well bonus actions and bonus movement i think um to call up some of these things that i think are are really are really strong are the double plus one movement plus one attacks on every fighter um or like that can be used on any fighter very good um that's a very strong double um the all-out attack on the leader um just that a double for a bonus attack or a bonus mood action is very is, is i think very is very um very strong, very um, good use of dice. Um, just finding a use for that double. Um, and then and when the... you're surrounded by mind bound and mirror blades, and you want to get as <laughs> take as many of them down with you as possible, that is the right one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better than yeah, quad. Yeah, if you can take down an extra model for a for a double, that's that's super great. Um, yeah. You know, it's like thinking about a quad is just about, it's just an extra bonus movement from that. Um, and it's just, you're half the dice. And then the Beastmaster, um, giving that bonus attack to the, to a, a fighter that has a very strong attack within four inches, I think is also good. Yeah. Um, pounce, situational, but we can be good. We have a very similar, we have almost the exact same, uh, ability on the squig hoppers. Um, that's, uh, um, that's the one where you just get the, uh, whatever the value of the ability is in damage when you move on to somebody. And then the harpoon snag, I think is, is a bonus attack action, which is, yep. um, yeah, yeah. A, a triple for a bonus attack is good plus the benefit of movement. So if you, if you're within range, that, um, first fang can just make three of those ranged attacks. And I think that's also super good. The only stinker on here is the quad. Um, where I didn't also, I also did realize it's only to the end of the battle round, and that makes it like, how yeah. often is this going to be actually better than rampage? Very rarely. Yep. You not just want a bonus attack, yeah. um, and that and that that one also gives you the bonus movement to get into position. So mm-hmm. that one very very situational. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think but, I think uh, like, go ahead, Josh. Yeah. No, I I think. You, you make great points. And I think one of the ones that um, well, I think people know about, but uh, I think is extremely important is the B speaker's ability to let the rock touch prowler attack again. Because not only is it immediately, it, it kind of surprises your opponent because you're like, okay, well, this rock touch prowler is already activated. Okay, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, no, wait, I do because the B speaker is gone and it, now it's attacking me again. You know, yeah. so it's, and that, it's, I was just going to say that that's my favorite thing. Yeah. Is it, to it, make people think, oh, the rack dust prowler is done. I'm safe. If I yeah. survive that, I'm good. Right. And, 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 uh, the Legion, Legion of Agash has got some stuff that does that too. And it, it's always, oh crap, these things are happening immediately. I've got to deal with it now. And if I don't deal with this high wound model, it, it, you know, the B speakers, yeah. you know, if you take one or two, have the ability to keep activating it again, essentially. So yeah, it, it can be a high threat high damage material you gotta you gotta mitigate somehow yep the b speaker becomes a high priority target um yeah as people get to know the army uh and exactly she, and, and she's a rock only, prowler 
Yep. And she's only, but she's only 15 wounds. Right. Uh, and often if it's the choice between attacking the prowler, uh, and, and her, people go for her, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, things that are great for the rock tusk prowler because you want, again, I, I get in trouble where I've, I've rushed the pro- rock tusk prowler in to fight something. Um, and he doesn't kill it the first time around and get swarmed and killed before the B speaker can get to him. Cause he's much faster than, than the B speaker is. So you have to kind of hold him back a little bit. Maybe first round, it doesn't get in, um, unless you're got a very close deployment, you got to wait until maybe they're together so that she can make him uh, kill whatever uh, it is up against, so that it doesn't get retaliated against. So yeah, uh, well, yeah. with the beast, beast speakers, you know, four inch range too, you can get her close enough to, or to activate the rock test prowler, but still attack. You know, it's a good yep. combo. Yep. The first fang gets underestimated because often they're just standing there doing nothing waiting uh and they come in at the end of the round and they're rarely the one that's like making the big noise with like killing something or targeting their leader or you know that sort of thing so the first fang tends to be left alone quite a bit uh which is interesting um how do you guys feel about the planes runners uh they annoying uh they do they do they seem to be a uh a va- uh, what would you call it? A worthy opponent. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many points are each playing runner? Fifty-five. Fifty-five. That's good value. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. I think the only cheaper is the Aether Wing at forty-five, but they're only six wounds and they're two strength or two toughness. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, the the Netters are forty-five. Is yeah. oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, no. No, I think the I think they're great because they're they're fast. Even though they have low wounds, you can take a lot of them for extra activations, or for claiming quarters, claiming objectives, for outnumbering your opponent on objectives. I think they have a lot of versatility in that sense. I think one of the things I struggled with um, playing against the Untamed Beast a lot was that there are so many more unique uh, roles for your models than there are for the Cipher Lords. That it's like, okay, I got to worry about the harpoon guy because he does this. I got to worry about the rock tusk prowler because it's fast and it's dangerous. But this beast speaker has a whip and it can reactivate the rock tusk prowler. Oh, but but those planes runners are fast. So they're going to grab that objective. Oh, and then, of course, there's the heart render. You know, so there's just there's a lot more different tactical aspects that you got to try to control, which which is fun. You know, if you're using all those, then you get, it gives you a lot of tools in your toolbox. But it's definitely yeah. something I struggled against. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have found that I build different lists at my different convergences. Uh, I have, uh, and I, I can't go, I don't know that I can speak to the convergences or, or which one I did which list with. Um, but for instance, uh, there is a build where you have, you know, a rock tusk prowler, a bee speaker, your heart uh, eater, and then you take five, six, seven planes runners. Um, I think it's, it gets even more like you, you've got, you got more power on the table. Um, but you can get a lot of planes runners in to just, uh, again, amp up that, um, bodies on the table, number of activations using the weight, uh, to give you, you more space to, to, to determine where you want to act or when you want to act. Um, and then on the, the reverse side, uh, there's a build where you can have multiple rock tusk prowlers and B speakers, um, to get put more you know it's still it comes down to like six or seven models so it's not as many you know 12 as 12 or 13 but uh you know so you don't have as many activations but you can apply power pretty strong in in a you know in a one location at a time right um, and then there's there's builds in between there's much like i really enjoyed this army right out of the box um you know with the the models that it provided with the um with the you know I still didn't put the the. I don't think I had the. Maybe I did have the prey takers in the first few games that we played, um, but there's just a lot of variety, and that makes for a really fun um, kind of experience on the board. That you just kind of have a lot of different things that you could do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and themes you can go with. Yeah, definitely. Um. Well, that was our deep dive into the cypher lords and the untamed beasts 
If you'd like to share your armies, your experiences um, uh, with the Cypher Lords and the Untamed Beast with us, you can find us on Twitter at Dogs of Warcry or catch us on our Discord where you can share photos and experiences there. And when it comes to our Circle of Pain, um, share with us your ideas for a Warcry table, whether or not you're going to build it or not. And if you are going to build it, share progress with us on Twitter and Discord. We've enjoyed another episode with all of you. Until next time. It's time to put a muzzle on this episode. If it was a good, good dog, support the show with a positive review on iTunes, sharing it with friends, joining us for hobby discussions at themotorrealms.com forward slash discord, or leave a tip at themotorrealms.com forward slash Patreon. More content is available at themotorrealms.com and on Twitter at Dogs of Warcry. Warcry.